Okay, hello, good evening, and welcome to University of the Arts London to the Symposium on Practice Research in Social Design, Definitions, Contexts, Futures, taking place this evening, um, a beautiful London evening, and tomorrow in this room, as well as being filmed and live streamed. Um, so let me first extend a warm welcome to those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are joining online. We currently have about 100 people um, um, in the live stream. My name is Lucy Kimball. I'm a professor of contemporary design practices and director of the Social Design Institute at UAL. And I'm the chair of this symposium, um, which has been organized in close collaboration with the Center for Sustainable Fashion, the Center for Circular Design and the Design Against Crime Center, um, all at UAL. And over the next day and a half, you will meet uh, many UAL colleagues and PhD researchers, um, um, as well as hearing from researchers and practitioners from other fields and other institutions. So we're first going to hear a welcome from Professor David Umbar, who's the Deputy Vice Chancellor responsible for research uh, at the university. So over to David. Good day, everybody. I am Professor David Umbar, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Knowledge Exchange and Enterprise. And I would like to welcome you all to the University of the Arts, London. Whether you are online or here in person, a very warm welcome to you. Given this is the first event since the announcement of the REF results, I, you would forgive me for using this opportunity to say how brilliantly we did in the last REF, and also to say that we ranked top number one in research power for arts and design. Fantastic achievement um, by, by all, um, all those involved um, and something we are very proud of. Um, so for today, we are proud to host this symposium because at the University of the Arts London, we have an outstanding track record in social design with our award winning specialist research centres, including the Centre for Sustainable Fashion, the Centre for Circular Design, the Design Against Crime Research Centre and our Social Design Institute. UAL covers all the main creative disciplines, as you can imagine. Among them, design is an important one and itself varied. We currently have around 60 PhD students in social, in social design and design for sustainability, many of whom are using practice as a methodology. We also have very many colleagues using practice as part of their research with partners and with other academic disciplines. So we therefore thought um, it was timely to look more closely at definitions, contexts, and potential future for the practice research in design. So once again, delighted to welcome you online and in person for the next day and a half to share ideas and engage in this interesting debate. I hope you have a great day, a great day and a half. Thank you very much. Who apologizes uh, for not being able to join us in person, um, but he's helpfully partially set the scene by mentioning REF, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, it's the UK uh, funder and government's way of assessing research quality uh, um, of UK universities and the results were published last week. And that's one framing or context for this discussion. Um, any such event and a symposium like this exists at a moment in time. So depending on your area of focus, um, maybe you've been paying attention to the REF results uh, from last week. Or it might be that you're still digesting the results of the report by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes, Working Group 3, which said in late April that the world is not tr on track to keep temperature rises to 1.5 degrees, but could still just about if the right steps were taken. And any event also exists spatially. Um, we're joined by people from the live stream from all around the world. Um, but here we are in London. We're right next to the River Thames that's just over the road there. Um, at Chelsea College of Arts, which is a former military hospital. We're right next door to Tate Britain. 
And if you go to Tate Britain, you'll see the installation in the large main galleries um, by the artist Hugh Locke, which brings into view the bodies and histories of those affected by colonization, slave ownership, and the slave trade within an institution whose uh, foundation and collection has some of its origins in wealth associated with the slave econ economy. Um, and we're 10 minutes walk from the Houses of Parliament, uh, which on a practical as well as a symbolic level um, is the center of British political life and therefore closely implicated with urgent issues like uh, responses to the climate emergency, health inequalities exacerbated by COVID and widespread poverty to mention but a few. So in the face of these presents and these pasts, it might seem luxurious to discuss something as abstract as definitions of practice research. There are plenty of global and local challenges that design researchers and designers are already working in relation to. Why invest time and resources in more talking? My answer is that it's only through coming together for dialogue and debate that researchers and participants in research can create new understandings in relation to communities of practice and communities of inquiry. And on the one hand, the hybridity and the plurality of practice research in design is necessary and welcome in a world in which problems are complex, ambiguous, and contested. But on the other, a lack of a clear definition of practice research in social design may limit its effectiveness reduce its consequences and claims to knowledge and, and results. So we have programmed this symposium to look at different aspects of practice research in design, its contexts, its definitions, its infrastructures, its publics, doctoral study, um, the realities of doing it, and possible futures. And this evening we have the first panel um, to hear about the broader context from people with distinct perspectives on practice and research and design. Um, but before we start, before I hand over to them, some practical matters. The event is being live streamed, so it's being recorded. Um, it's organized overall in six panels, of which this is the first, um, each of which there's about an hour long, um, with plenty of breaks in between for comfort and sustenance. And we do hope you'll stay with us for a drink and some of that lovely food afterwards. If you're using social media, we're using the hashtag, um, hashtag design practice research. And so for this evening's format, I'm going to ask the panelists about two to three questions, and then we'll have an opportunity for the audiences here in the room, as well as the audiences online to have questions. And we have colleagues on hand with microphones and colleagues on hand in the digital um, Zoom, Zoom arena to also make sure your questions can reach the panel. Um, so I'm going to move on to uh, start with a teaser question and introduction to our panelists and I'm very delighted they agreed to join the discussion and help us set the scene for this discussion. So I'm going to start with you, Indy. Uh, Indy Johar, you're an architect, uh, architect um, t very closely involved with questions around public innovation through Dark Matter Labs and your architectural practice. Um, can you share one thing that excites you about the doing of practice in relation to social issues? Um, the one thing that excites me is working at, the, at a polymathic level. I like the fact, as Dark Matter for the first time in my practitioner life, we're working at the intersection of finance, intersection of kind of policy, law, contract, and seeing design as an act of synthesis across these disciplines. And that requires us to reconstruct languages, re-synthesize value in a new way that a finance person won't understand fully by themselves, nor a contract person or other people. And that's really, I think, we're living in a moment with, where the act of design, which is the act of synthesis, if the act of management is the act of maintaining. And I think there's a new world to be synthesized. And that requires polymathic capabilities, not disciplinary capabilities, but polymathic capabilities across disciplines, which I don't think I've ever experienced in my life, having worked also in multiple institutions. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn to uh, Harriet. Harriet Hawkins is Professor of Human Geography and uh, involved in Geo-Humanities at the University uh, at Royal Holloway, University of London. So you've got a long-standing interest in creative practice, and you're also the uh, director of the Techni Consortium. 
Um, can you share one thing that excites you about the doing of practice in relation to social issues? Um, yeah, I can. And unfortunately, I'm going to read some notes because this is one of the first live events I've done in a while. So it felt better to not waffle too much. So I think my one thing would be, um, I guess, the kind of inspiring, diverse and sometimes disruptive models that practice offers for my discipline of geography. So for ensuring that researching social issues is about also intervening in these issues and bringing about change. So geography is a discipline, fascinating thing I thought was just said, um, love claiming to be polymaths. You know, geography departments in the UK tend to bring together sciences, social scientists and arts and humanities scholars, all interested in questions of environment, space, place and difference. Collectively, we pride ourselves on both understanding but also intervening within social and environmental issues to bring about change. In short, geographers like to think of ourselves as up to the challenge of so-called wicked complex problems. Yet oftentimes as a discipline, I think we fall short. We might share a building and some students, but sometimes not a lot else, sadly. But where I think geography has started to engage um, with practice in relation to social issues, as a discipline, it's forced us to reflect really hard on how we do our research, on who we do our research with, and how we engage those communities with our research processes. But also how, as a discipline, we commit to transformation and change in and through our research processes and what we may or may not call outputs. So as geographers' engagement with practice research around social issues has become more common, it's become really interesting to see how forms of practice, from creative writing to fine art and experience design, offer specific models and examples of how to bring together research and social issues, but how these examples offer for us as a discipline points of challenge, friction and disruption to geographies' existing ways of doing research, inspiring them and provoking them to become better, more generative and forceful, and I think really importantly for us as a discipline, more democratic. Fantastic, thank you. And we'll come up to those points, I think, uh, in, in a moment. And then uh, thirdly, um, Pratap Raghani, um, Professor of Documentary Practices at London College of Communication, as well as Associate Dean of Research. And you've got a long-standing and highly regarded and award-winning practice of using creative methods, for example, um, working with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Um, can you share one thing that excites you about practice in, research, in relation to social issues? Thank you and thanks everyone for being here and I really appreciate how Lucy and the whole team have conceived this more expanded notion of design so that someone like me can feel like I can be part of that conversation which is the interdisciplinary polymath nature and also the art practices. So the thing that really excites me is making, making. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a flashback to um, this room about three years ago with uh, Professor uh, Oriana Badley and uh, Roger Kneebone, and in, Roger Kneebone's a surgeon, and he talked about his fingers, and he brought together, through the act of su suturing and surgery, he brought together that medical knowledge, haptic, haptic knowledge, with um, some researchers from the London College of Fashion, and together they were looking at what making means, which doesn't necessarily get conceived and articulated in formal, as it were, academic terms. And when people want to communicate in, on these sorts of platforms, often we feel we've got to justify ourselves by having some kind of traject conceptual trajectory that we can refer to. That's a very fine thing. However, making, I think, um, touches the ground of social purpose, of action, of things that we want to change in the world. When, when I'm you know, working in my camera practice, the way that we frame, visualize, all of that is being tested by how we conceive in the practices of, you know, cr creativity, if you like. So thank you for those introductions. Um, I want to look at what the achievements are, if there are any. The achievements and what's been learned from practice research, which obviously is institutionalized or done in different, different ways in different disciplines and not necessarily in the academy. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Indy. So what, what's the achievement and what's been learned from the blurring of practice and research? Mm, I actually think we're at a weak point in that transition. Um, I, I, I think we've largely taken disciplinary thinking and moved it into a practice domain and said that's interesting. But the problem is that most practices are still disciplinary orientated. So, and so we've just kind of exported some academic thinking and put it in or vice versa. And actually, I think the problems are much deeper, the challenge is much deeper. That I think, you know, in every age when you go through such a significant liquidity of how we see the world, 
And I think we're going through a fundamental transition of how we see the world. It's the, kind of the Newtonian enlightenment for the last 400 years was a way of conceiving the world in separation, in classification, in division. Yet we're moving to an entangled, interdependent world. That worldview requires new polymathic capabilities. I use that word again. Because I think it requires a new form of beyond single discipline ways of organizing. And I don't think we've yet reached that. And I think practices like ours and others are struggling to break through from a disciplinary silos to be able to actually build the polymathic capabilities within themselves to even conceive and respond in the right way to the outcomes that are generated. And that's a function of actually this disciplinary lineages that need to be broken and remade in new ways. And I think that's a structural challenge. And, the, and by consequence, I think our, here's me being really difficult, I think our research has become, our academic research has become increasingly what I would call impressionistic. It's an impression of the world. It's a kind of a visual impression of the world, actually as opposed to being able to deal with the entanglements that, re that happen in space, in context, in situations, in reality. And I think that's a really fundamental issue. So I think we're in a weak point, but that's, uh, but that's also a journey of transition for going from where we are and where we need to go to. And I think that will challenge our theory of disciplinary or based organizations, both inside practice, but also in academia. Thank you. So I'll come back later to this question of design as a synthesizing thing to deal with this challenge of transdisciplinary, because there are colleagues, uh, people who are making the claim that design is some special source to, is particularly good at that. But if we could go, um, um, Harriet, so to that same question. So what are the achievements and what's been learned from the blurring of practice and research? Mm. Thank, I think, so, so again, thinking here with geography, um, I think the most profound achievements, actually, of these blurrings have also, in fact, been their learnings. Um, so if that makes sense. So learnings, I think, have brought about a step change, I, I think, in geographies, conversations, and practices that's forcing us to rethink our kind of research business as usual. So recently, for example, geography has been talking about itself as undergoing a creative turn. And we can obviously think about all the kinds of problems and challenges of those particular kinds of understandings and paradigmatic claims. But it's really understood as a kind of turn to practice, at the core of which is a sense of geographical research enfolding creative practices primarily as new methods and tools. So this might be a geographer using participatory filmmaking with community participants, collaborating with dancers to investigate embodied approaches to space, including things like border walls or migration practices. Or it might be using drawing with interview participants to broach challenging emotional issues around migrant stories of journeys and things like that. So these are really exciting kinds of intersections of some kind of iteration of creative practice and research and hold lots of possibilities. But um, they really did situated with a geography as just another kind of method in a toolkit, which, of course, is a really, really valuable thing. But it also bounds, I think, the value of practice to thinking about it just as a kind of methodological question. And I think it's actually so much more than that. So I think we now see something very different happening in my discipline. I think an intense interest in what it means to start to discuss and work with practitioners and also have practitioners come into my discipline as researchers means it really much, it very much exceeds the sense of practice being a method, but requires us to revisit our basic assumptions and re-challenge them and, and recommit to them sometimes. So um, this includes things like the role and the practice of research questions. Do we think about hypothesis in the same way? How do we do ethics? What do our ethics frameworks look like? What about case studies? What about the commitment geography's long had to questions of it being a field practice based around kind of visiting particular field sites? How do terms like rigor and originality work in our discipline with all these different trajectories from science and social science, arts and humanities and practice coming together? Do we rethink rigor? Do we think a more situated, imminent sense of rigor that works for each of our individual projects differently? So we see, I think, changes then in the basic infrastructures of our research, both these sorts of conceptual infrastructures, but also, I think, those sorts of practical infrastructures. So we have practice-based PhDs that can look you know, very, very different, and they're quite, quite often up to the student to shape those with, with their team. We also have different sorts of journal practices now and different sorts of monograph practices, each of which tries not to just ask us to reproduce the same kind of frameworks of how we've long done geography and long published geography, but ask us to sort of creatively inhabit it, some of those formats and work with them and change them. It's not easy, but I think it is really, really interesting. I think a second major achievement and learning from the research kind of practice blurrings for us is the potential they hold for, I think, moving us beyond that sense of interdisciplinarity or thinking beyond disciplines as merely a kind of abracadabra kind of a thing. By this, I mean a kind of 
into trans or cross-disciplinarity that feels like a bit of a magic trick, a flourish or a kind of accumulation of a certain kind of capital that actually really, when it comes down to it, is, is something we put in our abstracts or something we put in our grant applications or in our, in our kinds of CVs. How does it really change how we do our research or how we do our practice? And so geographers, I think, are being kind of pushed pushed in the kind of, you know, the rallying call they've done for our discipline around being interdisciplinary as being polymathical, when they come together with practitioners to really think hard about what it means to make those claims and what it means to kind of, I guess, walk that kind of practice research walk rather than just kind of nod towards a kind of, you know, oh yeah, we're cool, we're interdisciplinary. And so I think there's, you know, really, really productive things for our discipline. So thank you all for doing such great work that we can all learn from. Um. Thank you. And then Pratap, uh, the same question. So what are the achievements and what's been learned from the blurring of practice and research? Achievements and blurring of practice. I'm, I'm really, um, thank you for what you're both saying. It's kind of changing a bit the way I'm, I'm thinking. But uh, the, the phrase that comes to mind at the moment is our strengths are our weaknesses. And so the, the genius, if you like, of the enlightenment, post-enlightenment, disciplinary depth, as it were, was that ability, is that ability to go into a significant conceptual um, and, and rigorous thinking. It's, its weakness is that um, what's happened to the body of work. Um, yeah, right, I could give some medical examples of that, but I won't. I'm going to try and respond in terms of what's happened in my own practice to give you a bit of a, a, a connection. So. Um, as a practitioner researcher, I see typically that the world bifurcates to keep these places discrete or even separate. But bringing the two together, as many here do, really eminent audience, some of the key people pushing the thinking in, in, this, uh, in this zone. But bringing the two together, integrating these impulses of practice and research has opened up a new vista, and that's a real gift for makers at the moment. And creative practice research to... Um, quote this time Cornelia Parker just opened across the world uh, the road she talks about her art practice as something that digests the world and that society needs um, in my case practice-based research is reconfigured is reconfiguring how I look at the world in my documentary practice and the moment I'll is it okay if I give that example okay uh, and as the example actually has been supported by the Institute for Social Design who encouraged me to, to write something called Designing for Dialogue. And to summarise that, um, when I look at 30 year, years of documentary and um, writing and photographic practice, uh, often in mainstream contexts as well as galleries, through doing these doc documentaries and photographs and things, sometimes uh, written about and sometimes with people facing conflict, atrocity and their aftermath in, in various places, including uh, Rwanda, Aboriginal Australia, and you mentioned work with the great Desmond Tutu. Um, I, I, I've conceived documentary as a kind of arena in which many experiences can unfold with enough open space for an audience to make sense of competing perceptions and experiences and settle on their own view. And that ideology helped me and that ideology is kind of underpinned in the core values of uh, quintessential British media public service institutions like, like the BBC, however flawed that conception is. But these days, I'm seeing a newer direction that all of that, that's not enough. It's lost sight of what's happening to the body of communication um, in, in the culture. So alongside the essential investigations of the fourth estate, creative practice research has opened up new vistas for a more relational media that's socially designed, here's my argument, that's socially designed and biased enough to nurture the connective tissues between communities, drawing on practices from restorative justice, including deep listening and searching for shades of grey. And I've come to that place and I've skipped the critique because of time um, about how radically oppositional and polarised not just big parts of the mainstream media are, but what's happened to the vast swathe of um, social media and where that leaves these the, the, the bubbles and the moments of touch and contact that make a culture. So practice-based research has, is enabling me to reframe that in terms of the embodied experiences of people in radically different positions. And I'll finish with this example of um, something which was uh, cultivated by the Forgiveness Project. And I, they asked me to chair a dialogue where I had a mum here 
a wonderful woman called Joan Scowfield, and the young man who killed her son here, Jacob Dunn, who's recently out of prison. And what the dialogue enabled through a much more relational attention and through the extraordinary suffering and struggles of these two people was an ability to refocus on what happened and reframe it and create an extraordinary release of energy to imagine something utterly different than what the uh, typical judicial system offers. So thank you all. Um... I think we've got sort of these snapshots of these different positions and possibilities. And there's a sort of assumption that it's a good thing, right? That hybridity and the, the releasing of energy and the um, polymath requirement is, is a good thing. So if we're saying it's a good thing, which in a sense the entire symposium is, <laughs> um, what are the barriers and enablers to doing it well, to doing high quality, whatever, however we're characterizing that? So what are the barriers and enablers to doing high quality practice research? Indy, can we start with you? Of course. Um, I think the number one thing is language. Uh, taxonomies of how we see the world and discuss it. And our ability to construct new languages, polymathic cap capacities requires the construction of new ways of seeing. And the second part, which is even perhaps more controversial, is polym I think to create those transdisciplinary or whatever, you know, multidisciplinary perspectives requires us to... Mm, move away from what I would call is a simple English brigade. So simple English, I think, is a tyranny on intellectual thought. Because actually, what you require is the fusion of complex different languages to occur with patience and empathy, with a deliberative space that supports it. And language is a means to build shared world views. It's not just a mechanism to communicate simple instances of transmission. And we've reduced language to an art of communication, not necessarily an art of actually building shared worldviews, which is a deliberative framework. And people often think it's about the words, and it's not. It's actually about the empathetic release and the relationships that you construct. People will tolerate not knowing a word, and actually, as we know with machine learning, you can pretty much understand most stuff through extrapolation of not even knowing the words. It's not about the words. It's about the frames we create for the debate. So for me, the language component. I'm just going to do the structural stuff, and then I think other people will contribute. The other thing is our, our funding and financing regimes. They fundamentally don't work for any of these capabilities. So that works also in practice as much as it does in academia. I don't think that practice is any more nirvana-esque. So I think there's a real fundamental question about how do you build the funding regimes and mechanisms that allow for genuine polymathic capabilities in, in a meaningful way. And currently, all the incentive systems don't work. And they're broken both in terms of disciplines, but they're also broken between practice and research. And thereby, the coordination costs of actually building anything is terrible. And the third thing I would say is most the way most collaborations occur Forgive me, I've been in far too many Horizon 2020 projects. <laughs> they are an utter waste of human life. <laughs> and they are just a space for giving individual actors to carry on doing what they're doing and then compile it at the end of the day and say it's some form of collaboration. I don't think we're actually investing hard enough in actually the means of collaboration and what it really means to do collaborative work. And that requires quite a different way of behaving and operating as people and our own ego and our building language together. So I think there is a fundamental change in our regimes that are required. And then also those regimes have to transfer to incentives. So most incentives in institutions doesn't, doesn't support collaboration. We know that's been a systemic breakdown in terms of, you know, if you're a, I know, certainly you know for an um, scientist field, if you're a mathematician, you're not encouraged to work on physics problems, right? That is not really what's encouraged you won't get published. You will actually destroy your, your academic progress. So there are some structural incentives which need to be re-examined if we're going to build the capacity that's necessary. And I would say most of the interesting work is going to be, is going to be and is happening at the intersection of disciplines. But we do not have the funding mechanisms, the institutional mechanisms, or the patience to build the language. And I think we need structural reform of our, of our research institutions to be able to do it. So uh, language and structural uh, yeah. structural regimes. Uh, Harriet, so barriers enablers to carrying out high quality practice research. 
Thanks. So I think um, if I think about enablers first, um, I think one of the reasons that when I speak to practitioners who've come and worked in geography for any period of time, whether short or long, I think one of the things that often comes up in some of those conversations is that geography feels quite comfortable sometimes because it's a discipline that thrives on research difference. So if you've got social scientists, scientists and arts and humanities scholars already working together, you've already got a kind of broad church of different working worlds, of different kinds of languages, of different sorts of paces of research, of different sorts of funding structures, different kinds of methodologies, tools, equipment, and so on. So in a sense, we're a discipline that's, that's absolutely used to kind of sitting with that difference and dealing with some of the struggles. But at the same time, also kind of finding productive points of commonality that help us work across those differences, whether it's a shared topic or interest, or a shared geographical field site, or a shared kind of imperative to social kind of change. So in a sense, the practice can kind of sometimes feel like within geography it become part of a rich melting pot. But that's, of course, not to say that it's in any way, shape, or form easy. Kind of people who come and do that kind of work and have to put themselves to be vulnerable in certain kinds of ways. I think linked to this, one of the things that has enabled at least a movement towards some of these kinds of ideas, although I take the point about the kind of structural barriers really kind of clearly, is that the kind of attachment to that language, both in a kind of public realm and also in a kind of funding realm, to the, the wicked and complex problem that, and the desire to kind of engage with that as a sort of at least an attempt to corral us all into these kinds of team-based contexts and require us to evolve new kinds of languages and new kinds of skill sets and new kinds of, you know, in, um, sort of computer-based architectures to kind of bring about some of these kinds of collective learnings. And I think that, that sort of helped some of us to at least move in some of these directions, even if we perhaps perhaps, as I was saying with some of the abracadabra work earlier, not, not quite realising that in the way that we might want. But we're trying, and I think that's, that's kind of useful. Um, I think on the flip side, of course, the, these enablers also have their kinds of challenges. So I think geography is really good at getting really excited by its practice and research relations. And I think geography is one of those disciplines that, like many disciplines, has a very concerning colonial history. And people have often kind of recycled some of that language to think about kind of intellectual colonization and the real dangers and challenges of kind of extractive intellectual practices that some disciplines can have in the context of other kinds of ways of working. And so some Geographers, I think, sometimes might need to slow down and kind of explode our creative fetish and have some of that kind of slow, careful work that you were kind of talking about and put some of our kind of disciplinary egos to one side. And I think that can sometimes, you know, the desire and the enthusiasm can outrun the kind of slowness of the appreciation of difference and the value of sitting with those differences. Sometimes then we kind of can corral different you know, practices being one thing, not paying attention to the differences between different types of practice and how different practitioners work in obviously incredibly different ways. And also kind of collapse what might be called practice research into any kind of fun relationship geography has with creative practitioners, you know, artists in residence or short-term collaborations. These are obviously incredibly different ways of bringing together practice and research. And I think as much as geographers get excited about these, one of the barriers to their kind of full fruition is our taking seriously some of the differences and nuanced amongst this. In short, then, I think the barriers can sometimes be about how the enthusiasm for all that's shared and all that's possible means that differences intellectually and, of course, practically are not quite attended to carefully enough. And I think that's one of those things that we can all kind of do together, think, think more carefully about some of these kinds of relationships. Yeah, thank you. Pratap, barriers and enablers. Barriers and enablers. I'll also go with enablers first. Um, social justice, environmental crisis. These realities are imperative, and in a certain sense, they enable us to do what... I mean, to give an example, uh, uh, at this university, a new storytelling institute, and they're gathering a hugely diverse mix of disciplines to, for, from here to look at how do we respond to, respond to the refugee and migrant crisis. Um, that we are outside our window, what we see and relate to in the world enable us to, our, our humanity, I suppose, it, it enables us to respond to what the world cries out for. Um, enablers and barriers, us, we are both a barrier and an enabler, depending on whether we hide behind the um, uh, gloomy description that, that Indy gives us of academics, you know, behind walled, um, protected um, gardens of their comfort of their own discipline. B 
but I, I can't really, you know, at the same time, more of me is in the drawn to the light because just looking at people around this room, there are people who've invented things like the practice research advisory group that's trying to help articulate what practice research can be in many disciplines. Many eminent people here, I know that the work that they're doing in different disciplines to connect. So I see a lot of enablers in, in this space. Um, and yeah, that's probably enough. Okay, I'm just looking at the time. I'm just going to squeeze in one more question before going to questions from the audience. So, uh, obviously, the practice research, we've touched, in a sense, on transdisciplinarity, collaboration, uh, problem-based research, and so on. Um, uh, will we still be talking about practice research in 10 years? Who would like to go first? Just mix it up. Harriet? <laughs> um, will we still be talking about practice research in 10 years? I suspect in geography we will be. Other people may not in other places, but I think there is so much... I think if we are to do the kind of slow work and take the time and think about what that means, and also I think take on board the really productive ways that the kinds of epistemological challenges that can come from practice research into the ways that my discipline works and some of its kinds of challenging inheritances mean that actually we do need to move quite slowly and we need to move quite carefully. And there will be the rush to kind of get things out you know, of all the different sorts of timescales we know. But I think there, there will still be those discussions. I think one of the things that most excited me about the invitation to speak on this panel and about the kind of reading the paper that you'd all prepared was that it attuned me to other, a much broader church of ways of thinking about the relationship between practice and research than geography has been attuning itself to. And I think it also made me turn inward and think about the kinds of practices my discipline has that might also be a kind of way of thinking and connecting across different sorts of practice and research. So I certainly think there's at least a decade way of thinking about and doing this kind of work for my discipline Maybe not for others, but yeah. Good job. Yeah, I mean, I did take about 10 years' time. I hope we won't be having this conversation, but we'll be having a conversation that's already integrated what we've come to label as impact, knowledge exchange, relationship of what our institutions mean in the world, and that that's lived and embodied in what we do. And then in, in 10 years, so that we'll already have that much, much more visible, he said, hopefully. And then we'll be on to the frontier of how that, that needs to evolve. Um, yeah. I, in 10 years' time, I'd like a, um, I like a different relationship between practice and research. So I think praxis has its own integrity of learning and research in itself. Yet what it misses, I'll give you a practical example, um, so if you want to reimagine the art of the contract in the age of care, that requires you to reimagine the idea of how you construct relationships with a philosophically different ground base. It requires you to reimagine price, value, recognition in a completely different way. Now, in order to do that in praxis, it's very difficult because it requires actually a level of work that goes outside the remit of practice economies to be able to develop. But the problem definition and the ability to work with research in a meaningful way in the articulation of these deep problems, which are deep both in terms of the, an economic theory, a care theory, an understanding of feminist economics in all sorts of things, that requires a quasi-depth of knowledge that practice cannot hold in its way. So I would like, actually, weirdly enough, things to come together and then become distinctly more powerful in the both, both their dimensions. And I think there's great opportunity for deep research. I, we certainly need it in a lot of the work that we're doing. We need deep research in a way that actually currently academic, in what we're seeing academic frameworks can't provide. With respect, I disagree. But maybe this isn't the moment. No, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Because I really value the emphasis you were giving us into around empathy, deliberat deliberative thinking, collaboration. And the practice-based work that I'm seeing in some areas of, you know, around, say, this institution, that's absolutely central. They're embodying that, trying to articulate that, trying else, to look though. at how to, 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 to I'm teach I'm saying something them. else. I'm saying yeah. something else. I'm saying there's a new space of research which requires a depth of work. I don't need, I don't need academics to pretend to be practitioners. And that's what I'm saying. 
I think there's actually a depth of research required at the interdiscipline of new capabilities which work with practitioners in a new way. So I, I, what I'm saying is we've, we're trying to do this, and I think we need to find a new complementarity. And I, I'm telling you this, a contract for care, our contractual architecture for working in the idea of care, you can pick anything, hospital, schools, is fundamentally broken. It's ideologically broken, it's broken in terms of actual technical, legal care. It's, that as a piece of work is both philosophical, economic, legal, service design, but it requires a profound level of thinking that it's really difficult to drive in practice because the economies of it. So I, all I'm saying is that I'm, not, I'm saying that academics don't need to be like practitioners. I need the academics to be like brilliant academics in a new way because I need that. And I'm, I'm saying that as, a, as somebody who's coming across these problems day by day and also being, you know, so for example, two days ago, I was invited by a foundation said, tell me which, which academic institution would you like to partner with? And this, there's an American foundation that wants to release money. And I was like, well, I don't know. I've tried practicing because I don't know where that, where that level of capability is. And I'm saying it from that sense. I, I, I slightly worry we're trying to be the same thing. Yeah. Actually, I don't need us to be the same thing. I need you guys to be brilliant at things that we just cannot do because of the, the slow, slow, it's almost a different digestive system of thinking that's required to work. Anyway, that was Thank and you. is there space in that model for some of the people in this room who would describe themselves as practice-based researchers? I don't define the world. I invite you to define it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I'm just saying that's what I would like to see. That was a question. I, I, I worry that we're trying, if I want to be direct yeah, answer, I worry we're trying to make it, we're trying to find this holy middle ground. Oh, we're, I'm a practitioner and a researcher. I think they're different and that's okay. And actually I want the difference to be enjoyed and become more powerful because I think in our symbiosis we become stronger and I'm missing that deep background. I, I don't need someone behaving like me, having the skills of coordination and hosting. I don't need that. I actually need a, something else. And that's where the problem domains are all opening up. So why is Bitcoin not a actively being able to be understood by most people? Because it sits at the interface between computational capability, monetary policy, all forms of crypto economics. And those disciplines make it actually most descriptions of it to be really terribly put forward. Somebody needs to be able to understand maths and other frameworks in different ways. So there's a different way of seeing the world. Yeah. And I think there's great power in the deep research that's required at the level of these crossing over disciplines that I think I personally massively value when I, see, when I come across it, because I think that that is undervalued. And I, I, as a practitioner, need greater access to people that are working in those disciplines. That's, I'd say it from that vantage point, not, I'm just one person. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So at this point, I'm going to invite questions from the floor. Um, Alexis is here with one. Oh, first of all, we're going to have them turned on the mic. So there's going to be one mic here that Alexis and one mic on this side with Gabriele. And then we'll take questions online, should there be any. Um, so uh, any questions, please raise your hand. And in the usual way, if you'd like to introduce yourself, that would be welcome. And make a comment or a question. So I see a question here. Then here, so start here, Ramia. Um, and, and also say if you'd like it to address to all of the panelists or, or just one. Um, Ramia Maze from UAL, uh, London College of Communications. Um, I'm really intrigued by the magical word, the magical abracadabra critique that you leveled on the notion of wickedness. And I think back to the millennial uh, magic of the third space that art and design would do in synthesizing all the major problems of the world. And I, I recognize these tropes as really easy to kind of uh, bring us together, get funding, and then lack the real core profound like ontological, epistemological and, and structural change. Um, and at the same time, you're calling for slowness and depth and Pratap mentions the emergency and the crisis. And I don't have an answer, you may not have answer, but if you have ideas about how you personally resolve those different calls, the need for deepening 
critically, slowly, structural, deep work, and at the same time, the reason those wicked abracadabra is needed and called for is because of the crises. It's a tough question to start off with, sorry. I have something that perhaps was something that you've just triggered in me having listening to the fascinating discussions you were both having because I think I've got a project currently that's called Thinking Deep that's actually about trying to think about some of these issues in the context of the subsurface and obviously playing around quite fundamentally with what does it mean to be kind of moving towards a deep thinking and what are the epistemological inheritance of a grounded, situated depth of thought and the kind of gravitas that we tend to apply to that kind of idea and, and what about footloose, quick, light, fleeting kinds of, you know, mobile kinds of thought. What is that, you know, how do we kind of reconcile the different values? And I think it maybe comes back to something that I was perhaps hearing in the dialogue that was just happening around um, these different relationships between practice and research. I think one of the things we've been trying, I've been trying to help happen within geography is create spaces where these can happen. And I know other people are doing this in far, far more astute ways than, than we do, but just attuned to all the different kinds of relationships that something called practice or something called research can have. And so sometimes if you've got an emergency, you know, we know there's emergencies that are huge and overwhelming. We also know that there's sometimes the lightning quick thing we need to respond to where you can assemble quickly teams of people who are experts in their area. And maybe that's one of the ways to think through this kind of need for the real deep research and the practitioner who does something different to something called an academic researcher. But then there's other times where the kinds of emergencies are urgent, but the time frames upon which you can act will inevitably have to be slower and more considered to build the skill sets. And then maybe that is where we can build together new hybrid forms rather than having to kind of bring our existing settled outness. And maybe that's trying to find a compromise for me about exactly that problem you articulate around, you know, the different time frames, the different time scales, the temporalities of emergency and crisis and slowness and ponderousness. But for me, finding an expression in deepness, shallowness, mobility, and a kind of worry around the evocation of a kind of ponderousness of thought that has to be, you know, have a kind of verticality to it that, that perhaps, you know, might not necessarily need that in a kind of unearthing and ungrounding kind of slipping around world. One, it's important to recognize it's not one emergency. Um, and these emergencies are happening over different time scales. Yeah. So climate change is a symptom of a problem, not the problem itself. Right? So you can have a, let's fix the symptom. But actually underneath it is a much more structural issue about our relationship to the world. So I, I think if we can see this stuff as, this is why I think we need different metabolisms of, of thinking, which actually coexist rather than trying to imagine that we all need to work with one metabolism. I think there's deeper work, like if I was to say, I think one of the biggest transformations for us will be over the next 100 years, we'll be shifting our language from object-orientated languages to verb and process-orientated languages. That's the big cultural transformation that we have to go under in order to be able to live in an entangled world and flow. And our object-oriented language is actually delimit it's limiting our capacity to see the world. Now that's a hundred year transformation and it won't happen like tomorrow we're going to construct our language again so so i think it's just seeing these different flows and different cycles but that doesn't mean we need to start the work on process oriented ways of seeing process oriented ways of communicating building new pathways to do that we need to start the work at the same time there might be other things like our relationship with the land and our idea of contract may you know we may have to move beyond the ownership economy i would argue and it's ownership, the opposite of ownership is not treaty or rent seeking or being in, sorry, um, renting of somebody. The, uh, beyond ownership is a new form of relating, being in treaty with something. And I think that's a fundamental transformation of our relationship with the world. And that requires both philosophical, economic, and other frameworks. And those are going to just already evolving. New Zealand, a river that's being made self sovereign. What does that really mean? And what does that mean to our idea of being in relationship to the world? That's a conception of self. I think the biggest cultural project that we've got of our age is reimagining what it means to be human. I think we're at the same moment as kind of Leonardo da Vinci doing Vitruvian Man defined an era of 400 years, 500 years, 
we're at the same moment of reimagining what it means to be human. And that's a cultural project, a cultural revolution of our way of seeing. So I, I suppose what I'm laying out is that there are multiple responses, and it, it is to exist in respect and different metabolism of those responses is really critical, rather than adjusting to an idea of a single emergency, which I think will limit our capacity and capability to think and process it. Oh, uh, just a couple of thoughts. Um, that d deep thinking doesn't have to take a long time. It has, in fact, our conception of time has its own, the fluidity of that. Um, yeah. Hand, so I'll, I've noted those, but I want to go to online so we're sort of inclusive with the people who are on the live stream. So do, are there any questions in the live stream at the moment to be voiced? Yeah. So I'll just, there's a couple. Um, tell you what, I will voice both of them and then you can respond to whichever one you feel you have a response to. So uh, how, as PhD researchers, can we contribute to helping practice research make the turn it needs to today? while being hosted within disciplines that may struggle with interdisciplinarity, even outside of practice? That's one question. Another question, what differentiates social design practice from the sciences and the arts in, re in research? Non PhDs. P yes, you can answer that. <laughs> someone else goes I, first. I, 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 <laughs> Okay. Um, I think it's, I, I mean, I guess um, if I am thinking about um, the kind of question about how as PhD researchers kind of, who are often, you know, obviously sort of situated in particular kinds of disciplinary context, how can you help kind of move beyond this? With my tenor hat on, I would say, please apply for some cohort development money and we can develop events and activities with you that can help this happen. But in a sort of broader context, I think one of the things that I think that the value of the cohortness that you can have as PhD students and the kinds of peers and the people around you who work, you know, in a similar time scale, often on sometimes very different things, but facing some of the same challenges that you all might face as PhD students, might be a way of kind of coming together across your disciplines in ways that gives you different kinds of different abilities to do that than you might have when you kind of end up sort of in particular kinds of academic cycles. But that's not to say, of course, that there's not the temporal pressures of a PhD. You know, we obviously know that there's only so many years and only so many activities that can be done in the context of that funding years. But please, I think, do, do think about the kind of very power and positioning that you all have to kind of do some of that kind of work because it is there. And as I said, with my techno director hat on, I would say, please apply for the money that we have to help you do that. Stay with, who's the questioner? Do we know? Um, oh, Don't worry, well, for that questioner. Um, stay, with, stay with the trouble in that question. Mm -hmm. Stay with the problem yeah. and explore that with your, a good supervisor or supervisory team will be alive to the depth of the inquiry that hopefully will break through whatever disciplinary constraints you're feeling and the team can morph and change, uh, other advisors can be brought in, but it, yes, stay with the inquiry and the, the beauty of what's trying to, to be born, if you like, will, will come through or should come through and if it doesn't, then um, there are things you can do about it. Um, right. <laughs> just to be fair, so nice. hold that second question because there were other questions in the room. So I next saw, this is just the order I saw, I saw Patrizia, Joanna, and then, um, oh, sorry, I don't know your name. So, Patrizia, do you want to go with a question? Thank you. I, I have a question, I guess, for, for Indy, though. He has started answering it, to be fair, but um, I, I essentially agree that we are not ready for transdisciplinarity because we don't want to pour the baby out with the bathwater. I, I want all the abstract mathematical theory and uh, arts for art's sake and whatever science led to penicillin, pen, penicillin or not, right? So in some ways, uh, we, we are saying that the uh, expertise that comes within disciplines uh, should not be uh, 
dissolved too soon, and yet the legitimation crisis, the everyday crisis, the fact that uh, no one gets uh, Bitcoin uh, comes from somewhere. So my question is about language. Like, how do you see the expertise that sometimes has like a lot of specialization in very technical um, methods and methodologies? Uh, how how is that reconciled on the level of language that fundamentally people need to speak to? each other to uh, alleviate the legitimation crisis of uh, uh, disciplines, right? Yes, totally agree. I, I, th I think the how is, I think, a really interesting question. And I would say the how is a function of trying to do something. Uh, whatever the doing is actually creates the vector that allows for the different languages and comprehensions to have to be put together. So here you could probably reference people like Mariana Mazzucato's idea of the mission. The mission allows for the combatory thinking to happen and the languages to be built across the disciplines because actually there is a goal which is not based on disciplines, but actually outcomes or transitions in that framework. That's what I've seen work really well, and that creates enough of a vector to be able to deal with it, and it creates enough of a shared alignment and accountability to be able to actually create the empathy to be able to construct that. The one thing I'd say is like, you know, this really st stuck with me, which is Mr. Ford, when he was building Ford in Detroit, I don't know if you know this, but he literally recruited the world's best metallurgists, world's best financiers from New York, from Germany, around the world, literally the world's best, from around the world and brought them to Detroit to build Ford, Ford Company. So it's really interesting that he was, he was very, very focused on a mission, and he constructed actually a multidisciplinary team of extraordinary capability. Like, I didn't know this. I, everyone talks about the myth of him. But actually, much more interesting is the fact of his capacity to construct that team. And I, I think there's something about some trajectory that allows us to build these things. So I'm going to ask a second online question, and then we'll pick up um, the, this question and that, okay? Yeah. Um, so the second online question was basically about the specificity of social design practice research as opposed to other kinds of practice research. What differentiates it? <laughs> Maybe we can hold that question for tomorrow because I think there's more design people talking tomorrow and it's maybe so so whoever's asked that question we really hope you're coming back tomorrow and the time zone works for you uh, all right so my eyes were next caught by Joanna uh, could we have the mic here and then here yeah you, you were you, I'm just uh, going in the order I saw <laughs> um, okay so um, um, I'm Joanna Bonert from Loughborough University and um, my question is for Indy actually on the the idea, uh, I mean, there's lots of things that captivated me, but the idea of deep research. And I'm wondering if we can query that, or if you can explain that a little bit more. I'm wonder, I, I mean, I see the role of practice, a lot of practice-based design research is um, for facilitating um, work. And I'm wondering if, if you see that, where exactly you see that deep research taking place. Like, is it, would that be something that social design researchers facilitate other researchers, other types of disciplines to do? Or is that, because often I see that. I mean, I don't, I don't see that as a, I don't mind that role. Like, I quite enjoy that role. Um, and, and I'm just wondering if you see that as something that we do or something that happens somewhere else and that we're, we're a facilitator of that, of that process? Or how, where, what, it, what is that, the deep research that you're talking about? Yeah, no, it's a fair, fair point. I suppose what we're seeing is, hmm, so say we want to move away from object-oriented thinking, noun-oriented thinking. Now, that's easy to say. I said it. Great. 
Now, what does that actually mean when you say, all right, now I want to construct the, an agreement between multiple, multiple flows? You are a flow, I'm a flow, we want to come to an agreement. What is the architecture of that agreement? How is it assembled in a post-noun way? I think that requires a whole bunch of disciplines to come together to th rethink that problem, both at a depth of a philosophical comprehension to new ways of understanding ourselves and our theory of identity or post-identity systems. And that requires a level of, and I think design is not hosting. And I think we often conflate the two. I would say a social design is actually about the bringing of those disciplines to an act not just of coordination but synthesis into something that something that wouldn't have operated by itself, right? So I think synthesis allows something else to emerge, a new thing that would never have existed uh, if you just combine the disciplines together. And that's what I think social design or design in that way does. It brings assembles that. So that's what I would say is a really powerful piece of, and it's structural. You, it's not like you can, you can, it, it's so structural that it requires some revising, revising a whole bunch of deep structural ways of seeing language, who the identity is, how do you refer to each other, all sorts of stuff needs to be unpicked. And that to me is types of deep work that, so if, if for example, service design was reimagining those sort of contracts frameworks, that is deep service design that allows all sorts of other relationships to be reimagined in new ways. And then, for example, one of the, a lot of the work that we're doing, we're saying that you're moving away from the idea of the private economy, you and I being in relationship as a private economy, or a state, state one-to-many economy, to a many-to-many. -many. So if you're into a many-to-many -many relationship, what is the architecture of that relationship? What happens when the contract itself becomes, has agency? and it becomes a thing in itself. So it becomes, have an agency in itself. How do we conceive that? So we're, we're seeing the fundamentals underneath our ground shift. Uh, really deep fundamentals like classification theory. So, you know, if any of you have filled out an equality and diversity form, that's built out of a classification theory. And the classification theory was actually fundamentally problematized because that's what creates the division that allows, that permits the violence. So what do we do there? How do we think further down that? And that's what I'm seeing is I'm walking on territory which doesn't have ground anymore. And I need people to build the ground. And we don't have the economy to build that ground. We don't have the knowledge to build that ground. And there's deep missing ground now. I'm, I'm walking on shells which are broken. Do you want to comment, reflect? We have another question, and then because we said this was an hour, and we want you to eat the nice food. Eat. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Mithali from Royal College of Art. Um, I wanted to ask Indy a question. <laughs> um, you distinguish between impressionistic research and research which was ensconced in reality. And um, recently, I came across um, an argument within um, a meta literature review on innovation which uh, distinguish between invention and innovation. And um, if I were to take those two words as metaphors for invention being the impressionistic research and innovation being that, they actually described it with an example. Um, Leonardo da Vinci did the sketches for a plane. At the time, wasn't possible, but there were sketches, and there were no means. Uh, but later, as the means develop, then, of course, we have planes. So um, do you think that impressionistic research may be quite significant in perhaps coming to new understanding on practice itself? Yes, but in different times. So I think this is a thing that, I, from my perspective, I preface everything in that way. Um, I, I currently struggle when people say, give us a vision of the future city. I hate that question. I hate it in multiple levels. One, I think it misunderstands how the future will be born. And two, I think it creates a colonized view of the future. It possesses the future. And my possession removes the possible possession and interpretation of other people's. So the resistance to actually taking the future is really important in moments like this. In other moments, like, that's why I don't think these are perfect answers, they're situational answers. And 
I would argue that invention typically uh, so is, 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 yes, the conception of something, and like the airplane, and is, but I would say that innovation is the didactic relationship of that invention with society. And it is that relationship with society that allows innovation, in kind of economic theory, it would be called working, you know, your, your market making as you're making the product, right? So it's that sort of function. So I agree with you, but I think the future right now is incredibly, I think we're, we're building bridges into fogs. And I think the question is not what future we build, but these deep fundamentals and recoding our deep fundamentals and a new future will emerge. I worry that we're trying to project future, futures from actually 19th century fundamentals. And as we recode our fundamentals, I don't think we can recast the future. So I'm slightly resistant of that. And that's what I mean by I have a problem with impressionistic futures right now, because they typically cast 19th century futures with a little bit more glitz into the future. So often, if I go into a conversation, I'll go, let's talk about cooperatives. And I was like, cooperatives are a 19th century answer, right? Everyone talks about community. Well, I'm not even sure community is the right answer, because every community creates an othering. We, live, we need to live in a post-othering landscape. So I think our language and taxonomy is broken, and that's what I mean by that. Those are just words I'm using to articulate something else. And yeah, so that's how I look at this. Would you like to comment, add something? Uh, well, just a question. Um, at the same time as that, you know, beautiful dream of post-othering, there's still the detailed realities of dealing with increasing polarization just i mean just look at the race conversation in this country in america in the last two or 14 months for example and the fallout politically in lots of our public spheres so there's there's the, the, the creative practice research of how to broker that dialogue in a way that can dare to conceive a new thing when the ideal of post other ring um is a long way away in, 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 some, in some parts of society. Yeah. Let's play with that. I yeah. think it's a really important point. So, mm, so, so one solution space of that would be creating these deliberative environments. Another way to look at that problem would be that we've created an economic frame, which is so 40% of Americans are within six weeks of losing their house. So when you create a social neurological landscape, which is actually... Uh, bias towards fear and, and precarity, you create a landscape which is actually vulnerable to the othering as a means of self-defense. And so the fear creates a mechanism. So what problem domain do we look at in that conversation? And then what is our analysis of that? So that's a different analysis, yeah. which allows us to then say, well, actually, and I would argue that we've lived through 40 years of economic construction which is now building us a politic of what we're seeing. And it isn't the language of other, it's a, not a problem of you and I. I think we've created economic context which actually manifests in the forms of power and manifests in the relationships that we're seeing. And that was also built at the time of 17th century frameworks of kind of, we know race, race was a construct to allow for violence, right? It was a mechanism to allow for violence. So I, I go back, I suppose I go back into those deep or deep, whatever, yeah. those structures yeah. to say, well, is there, is there a, are we going to solve the problem at the front side or are we going to have to look into yeah. those structural issues and whether we can deal with those? And that's not saying, sorry, I shouldn't have framed that that way. My apologies. It's not other, yeah, it's not other or other, but I think we just need to have that expansion. And I, I suppose what I'm saying is I need you guys. I don't know social neuro, neurological scientists that are able to make those explorations. I, there's some literature on this, but nobody I know looks at, at that landscape level social neurological biases as a result of economic frameworks. It's kind of new field of social, social neural geography would be, need to be born. Um, but it's critical to be able to make these understandings yeah. and then by talk about what's the role of democracy in those things. So I suppose I, that's what I'm saying. And I need the academic world to be building those new fields because I know they're, they're what's causing it. And I think we will close it there because we'd like you to come back tomorrow for more. So this has been an amazing introduction. I don't think any of us started with some um, dualism between practice and research. 
But I think this discussion has really problematized in multiple, multiple ways um, some of the terminology, the, the assumptions, the landscapes, the uh, infrastructures, and so on, and also the, the, the set of conditions uh, and, and the future. So thank you, uh, Indy Joha, Pratap Raghani, and Harriet Hawkins. And thank you for coming online and for coming today. And see you tomorrow morning. Thank you.